Well, here we go again. This is Texas, and of course, it's my pond, which is now dry. If you saw some of the other videos, <laughs> it was full, but Texas goes through change, uh, ups and downs. My boat, uh, kind of on dry dock. And here we are, horses out. Uh, you see those mountains over there. Okay, what we're going to talk about is the dark universe. Yeah, yeah, we know dog. Okay, let's talk about the dark universe. Okay. When did all this stuff start about the dark universe? Well, you know, it's been going on for a while. But anyway, let's get it with this. There was a guy, his name is uh, Jan Ott, 1920s. He's a Dutchman, of course, and uh, he had a telescope. And while working with that, and he's a very good astronomer, uh, he noticed and measured, and now we, we pretty well accept that the Milky Way is revolving that is just like our solar system it turns on its axis very interesting we've measured the the speed at which it turns and and feel very comfortable with that that that's part of scientific knowledge okay well he also uh jan also uh viewed that uh not only is the uh milky way our galaxy revolving but uh, the the uh, suns that are on the outer edges of it that he was watching he noticed that these suns weren't weren't describing a beautifully uh, circular or what we'd call nice flat line across the, uh, about the projected sky, he viewed them as moving in like a merry-go-round fashion, a, like a horse on a merry-go-round goes up and down, up and down. As our Earth rotated and as we went around the sun, uh, and he viewed these stars over time, these far distant stars, they were doing something very differently. They seem to be in some kind of oscillation mode, and therefore, something must have been causing that oscillation mode. Uh, we still don't know what gravity is, of course, so therefore, but we, we kind of hold, uh, generally, that uh, this force that keeps us pinned on the ground, and the moon circling around the Earth, and the Earth circling around the sun, we like to call it gravity. Okay, we, well, of course, it's an effect, an event, we could call it. Anyway, people have tried to describe this and try to understand it. Uh, Ott didn't have much luck. Uh, and they couldn't see anything other than big stars around with each other to cause this event. And the stars were so far out from the center of the uh, Milky Way that it uh, wasn't the center of the Milky Way. So what was causing this motion? Well, uh, came up with one thing. Was it something we, <laughs> we couldn't see was causing it, possibly? Some kind of mass had to be causing it, but we couldn't see this mass. So therefore, you know, missing mass, I think, is what uh, kind of came up with the term at that time later, become dark matter, okay? Doesn't that sound familiar? Does that sound anything like the ether <laughs> that at one time the, that was supposedly out there affecting all this stuff? Okay. Well, anyway, let's get back to seriousness. This brings us to something that, that Jan and, and other people, and it is the, the, the fundamental basis of this, of this problem we have. What we are saying is that if we accept the conservation of energy theory, observation we could say, if we, we say that no matter is created, nor is, no, is nothing lost. No energy created, nor is nothing lost. Of course, we forget where we should be throwing in here uh, Einstein's uh, <coughs> recognition that E equals mc squared, okay? Mass and energy are one of the same. So they can play this game of going back and forth, and that's what's happening. Well, anyway, the argument is if, if energy that is once emitted has a conservation to it and it travels through the universe or the space which is you know nothing nothing is going to get in its way and if nothing gets in its way then it should travel throughout the infinite universe infinitely on its path <coughs> and if that was true and then we sitting here on Earth should be able to see the infinite universe because there's nothing between us and it except space. And space is not dense enough. Even the Magellan clouds are not dense enough to hide energy of giant stars coming to us, through, to us from infinite distances. But something's happening because we do not see infinite stars. We do not see energy coming to us from infinite locations, and the energy that comes to us is dissipated. It's not following, uh, <laughs> not fo following the constructs of uh, conservation of mass. Light energy dissipates. Well, I've got my, con my reasonings, uh, observations on that, like a lot of people, but let's not get into that. Let's get into the simple realization and theorization uh, and formulation that light, 
Either one dissipates as it travels through space, changes we could say, or it doesn't. Einstein said it was bent when it comes near gravitational forces, or I would say magnetic fields, but they like to call it gravity forces. They don't like the magnetic, most people in the field don't like to call it magnetic field, but it, it seems to be magnetic field, not gravitational field. Anyway, light bends. Okay, well, hey, if it bends, it can do a lot of things, okay? So, as we, we see, in, but yet, if it even bends, we would say conservation of energy, it's still traveling. Should still be the same cons uh, same uh, volumes, uh, consistency and everything, therefore. It should travel on, even bent a little. It should travel throughout the infinite universe. We do not see an infinite universe, and there must be a reason for that. There must be a very strong reason why we cannot see light, conservation of energy, as it travels through infinite universe. So that tells us right away that light is not infinite in its motion through the universe it is changing and of course the only thing we know it could change to would be mass and then once mass is created it too will then change because change is motion motion is change <coughs> and we know that mass and energy can only do one thing mass becomes can emit energy energy becomes mass okay so therefore we can't see infinite energy that is trans that is uh emitted from stars that are infinitely distant from us because that before that energy gets to us it becomes mass somewhere along the line. So therefore we now know we cannot see the infinite universe. However, the reason <laughs> at the time that Ott, uh, 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 Einstein and people of this nature were formulating their ideas they they were still hindered by some conceptualizations that were difficult for them to work past. Uh, it was not that time yet, but they did wonderful work and just were brilliant people. Uh, where we are today, though, is at the fundamental crossroads of now having all of the information, and, and, and of course we're away from some of the religious constraints and theorization and, and prejudices that we tend to hold. We can now accept the concept that light does diminish. And that diminishing event is not that it's wasting away or that it's being destroyed, but it's becoming something else. It's becoming mass. And as we get through here, we can go through this whole discussion of why we cannot see uh, much of the universe and why things are happening that are beyond our sight. And of course, uh, what we see is not necessarily beyond our sight, it's beyond our comprehension. Okay, and the comprehension is that we still are functioning under this, uh, this attraction thing uh, on the earth and not putting it where it should be. And considering that this gravitational field and then throwing in this time thing, you know, uh, uh, deal is, is so much science fiction. Let's just go by with what we see, okay? And that is, uh, uh, if we can't see it, it ain't there. <laughs> and if we can't measure it, it ain't there. It has no, 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 it, there's no antimatter. There's none of this uh, claptrap, okay? There's just what we see, what we can measure, and what we can extrapolate. And one of the things is, we should be able to see the infinite universe, and we don't. Okay, the reason is, because it's not coming to us. We can't see that. What's causing the suns to uh, march uh, in the outer portion of the Milky Way in an up and down portion, portion? Well, we don't know. But we can extrapolate a couple of things. One is that we may be viewing those suns just as we originally viewed the wandering planets that were moving back. And every time we got another snapshot of it, it was in a different place. It didn't seem to follow the normal galaxies of stars moving. So those weren't stars, they were planets. So we may come up with something as simple as that, but uh, it's a visual illusion. But the thing of it is, is that light, as it travels through infinite space, changes. And it's a change within itself. And, and again, when we study this, and I and do go to the written log because I'll try to uh, organize this conceptualization a little bit better. But right there, let's go ahead and I've had my time and my and it's wet out here and <laughs> it's starting to gonna really start raining. So we'll just go ahead and clip off with a quick view of everything. And it is pretty. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Happy New Year's.